reintegrating back into society after spending a lot of time in prison or any time in prison for that matter. When people get out of prison, they're lost and, and I get it, they are totally lost. And I was, and uh, some of you have heard some of the stories, but you know, when I got out of prison, I wanted to get on a bus. Most people do, they want to feel the free world. You know, if you've been in prison for, well they say if you've been in prison for a year, just a year, you'll have what they call sensory overload or you'll be institutionalized. Institutionalization is a real thing and I never thought I would get it. You know, I'm an intelligent guy, got my degree in prison, uh, did paralegal work, uh, you know, read the newspapers, used to watch the news, uh, all the stuff that you think, oh, I know what's going on, but you don't. When I was in Atlanta, I didn't see a vehicle for over two years. Never saw one vehicle in over two years. You're behind 40 foot walls, so you don't see it. You could see something on TV, just like phones or something of that nature, and it totally will mess you up because you'll think you know about it and you don't know about it. You actually are more lost because you think you know about it. You know, and I, I advise families all the time on what to do if you have a family member getting out of prison. Well, now I'm gonna give you the lowdown on what to do if you know somebody or have a family member who's getting out of prison and how to handle them. Now, first of all, obviously when a person gets out of prison, they're gonna be excited. I mean, let's face it. I did 11 straight years behind the walls. I had four 12-year sentences, I did 11 straight years. So after 11 straight years, that's over a decade. Think about what has changed in your life in the last decade. And if you're young, if you're 18 years old, do you remember back when you were eight years old? Think of all the changes. How about just the phone changes, you know? Uh, they, they've, they change every six months to a year or whatever it is, and you take gaming and all that kind of stuff. Now, forget a person who's been in prison for 20, 30 years. So, I mean, they, they're in for a shell shock, like people have no idea. But even if you're in for only a short period of time, what the prison system does, and jail system, is they put they break routine into your head. They don't want you to be an individual person. They don't want you to have an individual thought process because they think you're gonna to try to escape or they think you're gonna uh, ban with other inmates to try to you know, disrupt the system, maybe uh, get some contraband in. And it's all somewhat true, but they don't want. So what do they do? They drill repetition and they drill making no choices into your head. Let me explain what that means. The average human being on the street today, you and me right now, we're gonna make approximately 1,500 choices. 1,500 choices. The average inmate makes 100. Think of what I just said. You're gonna get up this morning, you're gonna uh, whatever you did today before watching this video, you said how many cups of coffee you want, you want to put cream in it. No, you don't want cream today, you want half and half, or you want to change that up, you want to do something and not have coffee, you want to stop at the Starbucks and get a cup of coffee. What color shirt you're going to wear today? Nah, I don't like this white shirt, I I'm going to like a, you know, a blue shirt with a tie. You are gonna make 1,500 choices today. When you go to school, if you're a young person going to school, college or whatever, what are you gonna wear to school? That's a big choice. Well, who are you gonna meet? What time are you gonna meet them? Where are you gonna meet them? Oh, let's meet behind the uh, uh, school dugout, you know, on the, on the fields behind the school. Uh, let's, you know, do something there. Whatever you do, whatever, whatever, you know, compare notes, you know, about the day before. Whoever you are, you're gonna make a lot of choices today. The average inmate doesn't. Now we think we do, because I didn't think I would be so uh, institutionalized when I got out of prison. And I was totally institutionalized. I literally couldn't buy a cup of coffee. I could not buy a cup of coffee. Think of that. I couldn't make a choice, because no choices were made for me. What to eat, when to eat, uh, what time to eat when to go to bed, everything is made for you. The choices you make are for you. So you, you even when you think you have choices, you don't have choices. So here, you know, a person gets out of prison and if he's your family member, he's gonna wanna, 
it's funny, you know, this is a true story, of course, and my, when I picked up my brother, I told him, hey, bro, I knew what I went through when I got out, so I didn't want my brother to face that kind of situation. So I says, I'll come get him. I drove all the way to Flo from Florida, all the way to Allentown, Pennsylvania, Allenwood, Allenwood, uh, FCI Allenwood, to pick up my brother. I wanted to pick him up, and I didn't want him to face the bus and all that kind of stuff coming down. So I said, I'll pick him up. So we're planning it, I drive up, and I ended up, uh, told my brother, I said, Dave, don't bring anything out of that prison. Don't bring a thing. Don't bring clothes, don't bring anything. Don't bring anything, bro. You walk out there and you give everything away. And you just come on out and I'll be waiting for you. We'll get you what you want. We'll go to a store, we'll do whatever you want. You think, okay, he's gonna do that. I said to some friends of mine, I said, I will bet you that my brother brings out a cup. They go, what do you mean a cup? You know, that you buy a cup on the commissary and it's a coffee mate cup. It's the red, it's a white outside and you keep, you can make coffee. And, and he, li I said, I'll bet he brings that out. I'll bet he'll bring shorts out. I'll bet he'll bring whatever the sneakers or his shower shoes or something stupid like that. He's going to bring it out. And they go, no way, you're telling him what, I said, trust me, I'm telling you, I deal with enough people getting out of prison. Sure enough, I drive all the way to Allenwood from Florida, uh, which is Pennsylvania, Allenwood, Pennsylvania, out west Pennsylvania. And it took me a day or two, whatever it took me to get up there. And I ended up uh, waiting for him out front, all set to go. And sure enough, he comes out with a, a ditty bag, you know, like a laundry bag. You know, I call them ditty bags, a laundry bag. And in the laundry bag, it had his cup. Yes, it had his legal work. You always want to bring that. But it also had shower shoes, it had detergent, yes, detergent, like like my mother's not going to have detergent, like where we're going back, we're coming back to Florida, you're not going to have detergent. So he came out with everything I said he would come out with, because your mind says, okay, I'm going to be taken care of by my brother or whoever loved one it is. But you know, their justification is, oh, maybe they don't have laundry detergent. They don't get that you don't have to wait three days to go shopping. You know, you can go to a store right now. I can get up out of this chair and walk to a grocery store and pick up deodorant or uh, uh, laundry soap or a pair of shorts or go to Walmart, 24 hour Walmart. It doesn't get into your head, you think, because you've been waiting for commissary. You know, when you're in prison, you can't just go to the store anytime you want. You gotta wait for your commissary day. A commissary list comes out. You might get it. Some some places give them out. You have to fill them out and then go get your stuff. Some you bring your list in. You put it there when you get to the commissary and then you wait and they process your order and you go up and you get it and you put it in your bag and you go back to your unit. Sure enough, in prison, so you're not used to just doing things when you want. And to, if I'm gonna tell you, thinking, oh, let me, just in case, just in case is always the word. Just in case they don't have the deodorant. Oh, just in case they don't have a mug that I like. You know, oh, it holds a whole cup of coffee and I like the big cup of coffee. Like you can't buy one? You can go buy anything you want. Especially when you're with somebody who has money. I understand if a person has zero money, nobody's going straight to a halfway house. I almost get that, because now they have no money, they don't know what's going on. But when a person like myself calls you up and says, hey, listen, I'm picking you up, don't bring a thing. You'd think he wouldn't bring a thing. Sure enough, he did. He was institutionalized. My brother was institutionalized like I was. So how do you as a person, how does a person help a person like that? Well, the first thing I do is I tell people when they that person comes home, I don't want you to be telling them what to do. I want you to educate them. If you're a loved one, if you're a mom or a dad or a brother or a sister, the first thing you want to do is if a person gets out of, out of prison, you know, you show him your TV. He's not going to know how to work the cable if he's been in a decade. He does not know how to work that cable. Now, he's going to figure it out, but guess what you're going to do? As his loved one, and you're meaning this with all of heart, so I, I, I can't hate you. It's all about heart, but what are you going to do? You're gonna take the clicker from him and say, come here, let me show you how to work it. You hit the guide button right here, and then you can go here, and you can hit last channel, and look at all the channels. 
500 channels on cable. And he is going to look at you two ways. Down deep without saying anything, he's going to say, what does this person think? I'm fucking stupid. I don't care if you're the mother. I don't care if you're the brother. I don't care if you're a cousin. He's going to down deep look at you like, what do you think? I can't read. I can't figure shit out. I know I went to prison. Well, I'm not stupid. That's what he's going to be thinking. Not going to say it to you, but that's what he's going to be thinking. Especially if you're a little bit more like you want to help him so bad, so you grab the, the remote controls. Hey, come here, let me show you. Oh, you got to watch this show. Look, I, I taped it for you. Here, it's on the list. He is totally overwhelmed. And you, as a person who loves him, should try to integrate him back into society in a very slow and methodical way. You know, everybody thinks reintegrating or, and reducing recidivism. The word recidivism means to recidivate means to go back to prison. There's a very high recidivism rate of people who get out of prison. We have one of the highest. That's why the United States is a big failure in its criminal justice system and its penal system. The prison system doesn't rehabilitate, it punishes. Now part of that is what the law says. In fact, it's the first part of most the law books is punishment followed by its supposable rehabilitation. But sadly, they don't do it. Everybody thinks, oh, let's help inmates. Let's do this. Let's get them a job. Let's get them housing. And we'll reintegrate them into society. And they should have no problem. Listen, we gave them a house. Or we, we, you know, we got them a, a place to stay. And we got them a job at this you know, call center. Let me explain how wrong it is. Reintegration back in society is here. It's here. It's not so much in the money things. You need them. You can't put a person on the street because he knows how to survive on the street. and He's just going to do what he needed to do to eat, just like you would, to survive. He's going to do what he needs to do to survive. Well, anyway, so a person gets out of prison and you're treating him like he's stupid. Not on purpose because you love him, because you want him to get the best. You want him to have a uh, TV. You, he didn't have a TV. You know, most inmates don't have TVs. Only in some state uh, facilities do they have a TV. Most don't. Most don't have TVs and all that kind of stuff. So you might have a TV up on the outside area in the day room and you can watch it in a TV room and you don't get to choose. You're not the one who runs the controller. Who the fuck you think you are? You know, that doesn't work like that. So this person is most likely out of his league and he doesn't understand. You know what he does understand? Reading. Most inmates are avid readers. You learn to be a reader. You know, when I was in prison, one of the, one of the most uh, joyful things I've ever done in prison was I helped this dude with a life sentence. A life sentence. Me and a couple other guys, we educated him from literally he couldn't even read a, a, a passage the cat jumped over the moon he could not read that we literally educated him to where he got his GED and he became a reader and, and he was a, about a 50 year old man and he had a life sentence and you know what he said this is the best day of my life he was crying we were all watering up when he got his uh, GED in prison because we taught him to read it blows my mind that there are people who can't read. About 20% of all inmates are what they call functional illiterates. Functional illiterates. But that means 80% can read, obviously. I was an avid reader. And when you, you, know, when you read, you, you lose your mind. You can get away. You can get into novels. I read some books. I never wanted them to end. You know, you're reading them and, you're, and you're, you're going, you don't want it to end, so you put it down. And you might do push-ups, you might do a workout, and you, in the, especially in the hole, and then I'd read it. Boy, did it piss me off when someone ripped the pages out the back of the book to roll cigarettes, because that's what they use. They use the paper that was in books, especially the older books, the paper to roll cigarettes. You know, to roll, they'd get a cigarette and they'd make four cigarettes, call it almost like pin joints, and they would roll them and, and smoke those, and they would rip the pages out of the, a book. I hated when they rid them, uh, ripped them out of the back of the book. 
I got so mad because that's the last three pages could be the the most the best part of the book. It is. You wait. You read all this book and you can't you can't get the ending. Oh, did it frustrate the shit out of me? Anyway, I was an avid reader. Well, most likely your relative or whoever's getting out of prison is an avid reader. And if he is, you're better off giving him a book, asking him, "Hey, do you want me to show you this, or you want here's the book? You want to read about it?" You'd be surprised how many say, "You know, let me read about it." I like reading about it because I can absorb it better when I read about it. That's just the way it is. I absorb uh, what I want to learn better when I read about it. Yes, you want to be taught how to do something, and someone could show you how to do. It. It's funny now because when Darian teaches me stuff. I don't read about it. I usually ask Darian, and he'll, he'll educate me on the technology end of things. But on most cases, I like to read. I like to, I still read. I am an avid reader today. Some of you guys sent me books uh, of your books, and I've read them. Uh, I am just an avid reader. I like to read political books. I like to read venture books, Tom Clancy, uh, you name it, I read it. I, I, a person getting out, needs you to go slow. You know, reintegrating in society is here and in the heart. And you know what people tell me, you know, that some people are, ah, oh, they're just gonna commit crime again and go back to prison. We should just throw the key away. And I look at them and I like roll my eyes. I go, this guy's a loser. Because here's what happens. Even if you hate prisoners, let's say you're just an asshole and you just don't give a fuck. Maybe you're a victim of crime and I feel bad for you, but have forgiveness because hate only hurts you. But let's just say you just can't do it. Even if you don't like the people, you should want them to succeed. You should want them to succeed because if you want them to succeed, guess what? That means there's going to be less victims. Do you want a guy living next to you in your neighborhood who has hope, who wants to make it, who wants to be a tax-paying member of society? And he wants to, you know, maybe get a normal life going? Or do you want the guy next to you and lives in your neighborhood not to give a fuck? Do you want the guy that just says, fuck this, man. I don't give a shit about anything. I don't give a fuck. And when it gets close to me, I'm going to, you know, grab somebody. I'm going to do something. You know, I hear, you know, when you hear a person say, I'd rather kill someone than go back to prison. Because that meaning, or get killed, or they call that suicide by cop. It's a real thing. Because people get it in their head, I ain't going back to prison. I look at myself, I'm not going back to prison. I don't do anything to go back to prison. I'm not going to do that. Uh, it's just not my style. It's not who I am. I don't want to go back to prison. I want to watch my grandkids grow up. I want to watch my son and daughter. I want to keep doing this for people and educating people. And making sure you guys understand that prison is more than just losing your freedom right then and there. It's about your family, it's about your loved ones, it's about uh, you know your future. There is no future. I mean, you lose so much when you go to prison, I'm still fighting. And it's wrong, and I hope to change that someday, but it is what it is. Getting back into getting a, a person back into society, though, is about here and here. And it's about educating the person, not so, yes, you have to give them a house or, or, or a place to go. It's called shelter. You know, the three survival things are air, shelter, and food. Think of what I just said. Air, shelter, and food. Those are the three things you need to survive. Think about that. If you have those three things, you'll survive. Well, we have to help with shelter, at least get them on their feet. You have to help them with food, so they have to make money to buy food. And of course, it's air. Obviously, with, that's the one thing you just get everywhere you're at, air. So you have oxygen you can breathe, but you need food and shelter. So we should give a step up on those things. But that's not what's gonna keep them out of prison. What's going to keep them out of prison is realizing, one, how much they're loved. So if you're, if you're a loved one out there, you know, and I'm sure you've told them and they, you know, they've been seeing you come visit them, hopefully write them letters or whatever you've done. Don't feel guilty if you didn't. Don't feel guilty if you didn't. I had to educate my own family on what to do about a person in prison because when I got out, some of them would only write me letters and they were long letters, but they wouldn't come often enough. 
So I used to tell them what to do. Hey, you know, if you have somebody in prison, write them a letter all the time, just once a week. You know, I always tell people, if you know somebody in prison, go get 52 envelopes, a box of envelopes. Put your return thing, put a stamp on it, and put their, what prison they're in. And you can even change that if, if they get transferred. But put a note in an envelope once a week. Just, I don't care if it's, hey, I'm real busy this week. I love you. I was just thinking about you. I saw this, you know, 1977 car go by and I thought about you because you own one. You know, I remember our Christmas together. Hey, Dad, I remember, you know, the good things. Or even if you don't remember, say something positive. They don't need to be coddled. They need communications. A person in prison doesn't need to be coddled. They need communications. So anyway, you need to educate. When you get that person home and now he's calm, don't throw things at him at, like, like a, uh, you know, a bucket, bucket a load of shit to do. Go slow. Go real slow. Ask him if he wants to use the washing machine. Don't do his wash. Ask him if he wants to use the washing machine. And if he does, you say, hey, do you want, want me to show you how to work it? Or let him try to figure it out. What is he going to do? You think he's going to break it? He's not going to break it. The remote control. The biggest thing. When I had the control, it's crazy to this day. I have to sometimes, sometimes I find my remote control in my car. Think of that. And that is because I, I had it with me and I wouldn't let it go. I know it sounds crazy. Goes to food. You might find out they're very regimented, most likely. And they're going to get up very early. And they're going to eat. And, you know, they're going to be a little bit, like, lost. So have things that are easy for them to make. Cereal. Couple of eggs in a bowl and show them where it's at. And a pan so he can scramble eggs. You need to make things easy for them, not complex. But they can read. So don't be the one, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. Listen, when you're in prison, you want to get out and do things. You're not lazy. Prisoners aren't lazy. They go to work, they have to get up, they go to the yard, they work out. You know, you become more lazy when you're out in the free world. I know. I'm not lazy by any stretch of the imagination, but I understand how I can get lazy. And then you need to have slow conversations with him. He's going to be dealing with his PO, which is his parole officer, probation officer. And they're going to get one of those, and sometimes those people are assholes. Now, you hope the guy gets a guy that's really good. He's going to have to do piss tests, so he's, and he's going to have to come up with $50 a, a, a month for the whatever the processing is of that uh, probation officer department. If you could help them with that before they have the pressure of that, that's a big deal. But you want them to start paying their way as well because they are willing to pay their way. He wants to go get a job. Now, guess what he can't do? Can't drive. If they don't come from a halfway house, hopefully the halfway house they go to has already processed that. Got them a driver's license or an ID card. Some people who get out can't drive because of uh, past tickets or past suspension and license. They got to clear that up. I wish the system would fix that and not put such hurdles in front of people, especially guys who've done their time. Listen, when you do your time and you do a lot of time, you should get out with a clean slate my opinion but it's not and they hold things over them so much but public transportation is not a bad thing and trust me when i was in the halfway house in tampa florida i used to like to ride the bus i used to go get on the bus and sit there and look and look at people and look outside the neighborhood and look at the new stores i like that kind of stuff remember that so, breaking it down, there's a couple of things you need to know, and this is important. To reintegrate into, into society with your loved one, go slow. Go slow. Remember, integration back into society is about here and here. Educate. Don't tell a person what to do. Educate them on how to do it. They'll, they'll do it. Support them in their job or their PO. Remember, that's another person that's going to oppress them. They just came from a very oppressive area or a, a situation in prison is very oppressive. They're coming down and getting the same thing again. And sometimes you got an asshole PO. 
So do what you can to calm him down. Let him know he's coming. Hey, listen, you know, you want anything? Remember, check your temper because the guys get mad. I did. You know, people can't treat you like they did on the street. You need to treat that person with respect because he lived on respect for the last X amount of years he was in prison. Never forget that. So those are the little things I want you to understand when you're thinking about people who are integrating back into society. No matter where it is, what it is, you need to help them. You need to educate them, educate them, and educate them, and in the right way, the right tone of voice. Don't look down on them, please, because they just were looked down on for the last amount of years, and I, and I hope you give them the benefit of the doubt of making it in this world. With that said, thank you guys. You know how much I, that this means to me, this, this uh, integration and recidivism and knocking all that down. I don't want to see anybody go to prison, you know. It, it, it's, it's a de depressing, very dark place. And it's a, it should be for our worst of worst. But again, the United States is missing a boat in a big way. But we can change it, and that's what we're doing. Thanks, everybody. Good luck with your family member or friend or relative or somebody who is getting out. Please give them the benefit of the doubt. Have a great day. Please subscribe. Please pass this on. Please post this because somebody might need it and you might be helping somebody. Share it. Have a great day, everybody. Much love, much respect. Stay safe.